Greetings, everybody. Welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast, officially sponsored by Running Aces Casino and Racetrack. I'm your host, Steve Fredland, and we are in part four of this series of looking at rebuilding my strategy. And I've sort of had to take a little bit of a turn, uh, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But first of all, here's the things that uh, I took away from the first three episodes based on all the feedback and all the research. And uh, this is at least where I was standing as of the start of this week. The first key insight was that I decided my default strategy was going to be GTO and learning what optimal is under different situations with stack sizes, position, stage of tournament, opponent types, and all of those things. But whatever GTO is, I want to be intentionally looking for situations where opponents are playing suboptimally and develop and utilize counter strategies to exploit them. That was my first takeaway. Secondly, for my standard pre-flop GTO ranges, for most of the tournaments I'm playing, I was going to consider 50 big blinds effective as deep stacked. And finally, I was going to group my starting hands by position with the first three spots in a 10-handed table uh, considered early position. So if it was nine-handed, then it would just be under the gun and under the gun plus one. And if it was eight-handed, it would just be under the gun. And my default early uh, deep stack range would be about 16% of hands, but then uh, constricting that range if the table becomes more aggressive with the bottom end of my opening range being 5% of hands. And so that's what I concluded after the first three episodes. But a funny thing happened on the way to this point. Um, As we started talking about GTO, I started wrestling with that concept. The the pros and the recs kept coming up with this idea of GTO. And uh, I found out along the way, as I considered to ask questions, that my thinking about GTO was very, very unclear and possibly quite flawed. So since then, I've had a ton of conversations with people about GTO versus exploitative play. I started digging in online to figure out what we are talking about when we talk about GTO, and I've come to the conclusion that I think many of us assume something about GTO that isn't actually true. So I'm actually going to dedicate this episode to giving my best explanation that I can, uh, hopefully in a way that's understandable to all of us recreational players. And I don't have any audio submitted for this. Uh, My dialogues have been through email, text, Facebook, Messenger, Twitter DMs, phone calls, and in-person conversations, but I haven't recorded any of those, so this is just going to be my voice. But I want to thank a ton of you who chimed in or had content online that I could use, but especially I want to thank Jonathan Little, Kenna James, Chris Fox Wallace, Max Havlish, Matt Hamilton, and Mike Engelhopt for being patient with me as I asked question after question after question trying to get some clarity. So before I share that, just a couple of things I want you to be aware of. First of all, uh, I do have the Patreon site set up. If you like this content, if you want to hear more of this and have me continue uh, doing this, I would love your support out there. Uh, You can pledge for as little as $1 a month, and all of that support uh, will go toward enhancing the podcast, both in terms of technical terms, uh, also as well as guests, and hopefully expanding us into new and greater things that all help our game. So you can just go to patreon.com slash poker. And also Running Aces, who is our official sponsor, they've got the Midwest Poker Classic coming up many events, September 16th through 30th. They're kicking it off with the return of the Optimum, which is a $200 buy-in with a big blind ante structure. And it ends with a $500 main event with a $100,000 guaranteed prize pool And among the other tournaments in that two-week span are a seniors event, tag team event, a black chip bounty tournament, and my personal favorite, the Six Max tournament. So you can go to runaces.com for all of the details. Now let's get into the episode. After all of the questions and the dialogue back and forth, I took a shot at summarizing my understanding of GTO versus exploitative play with a couple of follow-up questions I then sent that to several people with more knowledge about it, a couple of pros and a couple of recs. And so first what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the summary that I came up with after all of my research and conversations and then share their feedback. And then I will come back and talk about what am I going to do with all of this. So here was my summary and uh, final questions that I sent to the folks that responded. Playing GTO is about trying to take actions that are expensive unexploitable by my opponents. So it's really focused on making sure that they can't beat me. 
But playing exploitative is not about making sure that I am unexploitable. Instead, it's focused on trying to exploit my opponents, which could open me up to being exploited. Consider if I think a player is less experienced or otherwise playing suboptimally. Say, for example, they fold too much. If I want to account for this and decide to play more aggressively, is that actually switching to exploitative play? Or is that really saying that game theory optimal decisions are now slightly different? I suppose it's moving to exploitative, but the reason I would do this is that the extra value I think I can gain by exploiting my opponent is greater than the expected value I lose by becoming exploitable because I've moved away from GTO. Is this a correct characterization? Is it possible to play GTO but only play exploitatively in very specific situations against specific situations? So that was um, against specific opponents. So that was the summary that I came up with that I submitted. And so uh, I have a few rec players that seem to have a good understanding, and then I've got a few pro players to hear from. So this is what Mike Engelhopped said. Mike says, I am by no means an expert, but I would agree with your first paragraph. Playing exploitative is not about making sure I am unexploitable, but instead focused on trying to exploit my opponents, which could open me up to being exploited. Your second paragraph is where it gets gray for me. My best understanding is that GTO does not change depending on what you observe. It is a mathematically definable, so by my understanding, you are correct. GTO is not necessarily optimal, but I believe you need an understanding of GTO to learn how to play optimally. And regarding your third question, I don't think it's possible for a human being to play perfect GTO. My best guess is that even poker players who have studied thousands of hours of GTO rarely play GTO. This is because for every change in bet size, your range of calling, folding, and raising change and the percent of times that you take certain action also changes. For example, maybe you call with a 7 suited 59% of the time, you fold it 13% of the time, and you raise with it the other 28% of the time. No human can randomize those actions and keep track of them all. So here's where I'm at, Mike says. Pre-flop errors are small. The vast majority of mistakes and gains that can be made come on the flop. Therefore, I think the best way to improve at poker the fastest is to pick one or two pre-flop ranges to focus on and then start looking at how to balance them on flop decisions based on board textures. Then ultimately, I think if you really want to get good, you have to play around with these things using online poker and poker tracker software. I'm excited to see where you end up going with all of this. All right, thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate that. Next up is Matt Hamilton, who I know many of you have commented to me that you love hearing what Matt has to say, so uh, hopefully your ears will perk up with Matt. Matt says, It seems to me that you are correct in your understanding of GTO versus exploitative play. The way I like to think of it in terms of understanding is I view GTO as an equilibrium. It is my baseline, my approach to the start of every tournament, my hand ranges, my bluff to value bet frequency, bet sizing, etc. It is the sound fundamental strategy that if used properly will always be a winning strategy versus any opponent. One hiccup to this approach is that poker is not actually solved, and therefore the perfect GTO approach is not actually known. But that said, people have put a lot of work into coming up with very theoretically sound, winning GTO strategies. As I play, I make adjustments based on the play and tendencies of my opponents. This is where I deviate from the equilibrium and make adjustments to exploit my opponents in what is referred to as exploitative play. So using your example and taking it to the extreme, if we know the big blind, while we have the button, will fold every hand except pocket aces when facing a raise, the correct adjustment to make when it folds to us on the button would be to raise 100% of our hands. This would be a deviation from GTO play, which would have a button folding range, in order to exploit our opponent's tendency to overfold his big blind. However, it would be the correct adjustment to make, and using this exploit would make us more money than playing our GTO approach. It's important to understand that GTO play is not always the optimal chip EV play in tournaments. Playing GTO is all about having an overall winning strategy regardless of our opponent's ability and tendencies. And exploitative is all about looking at our opponent's ability and tendencies and adjusting our play based on them. 
As to your follow-up thought with his example, this points out a negative to playing exploitative. If we deviate from equilibrium to exploit our opponents, we are then making ourselves vulnerable to be exploited. It's hard to say how much value we will lose by becoming exploitable, as that depends entirely on our opponents making proper counter-adjustments to exploit us. But yes, I would say that in many circumstances, it is worth the risk from a value perspective to use exploits, and risk being exploited ourselves. That said, we need to always prepare to adjust our strategy if we are using exploits. If we begin raising 100% of our buttons and the player in the small blind is a competent opponent, he should pick up on the fact that the big blind is overfolding. And in addition, we are raising too much on the button. The correct exploit for them to make is to have a wide three betting range, wider than the three betting range from the small blind at equilibrium, from the small blind to exploit the fact that we raise our buttons too much. So if this happens, then we must make another adjustment and raise our buttons less, move closer back to equilibrium, because of the adjustment the player in the small blind is making. Additionally, we can think of a counter-exploit to the adjustment the player in the small blind has made, as their adjustment has also made them vulnerable to being exploited. In this case, we can exploit them by opening up our forebetting range from the button. As this example makes pretty clear, effective exploitative play becomes a game of constantly adjusting to our opponent's tendencies and deviations. To be used effectively, it requires constant focus and attention to detail and the ability to physically study our opponents with precision. The beauty of this approach is that if our opponents don't adjust or adjust incorrectly, we can effectively run the table and punish our opponents to the maximum degree, potentially much more than playing at equilibrium, GTO, would allow us to do. So ultimately, I like a blended GTO and exploitative approach, knowing that the more we venture away from equilibrium, the more vulnerable to exploits we become. In general, the tougher the opponents at your table are, the more you should gravitate toward staying at equilibrium. And the weaker your opponents are, the more you should deviate and make exploits. I think it's a great strategy to focus on playing a GTO-minded game and using exploits in specific situations, while keeping in mind that in certain situations, correct strategy will be to deviate far from equilibrium until our opponents adjust to our deviations. Hope this makes sense and offers some clarity. However, for what it's worth, I think you have a fantastic understanding already. Matt, thank you so much. As always, that is fantastic stuff. And now I want to hear from, uh, let's hear what uh, Max Havlish had to say. Max is uh, a good buddy of Matt's. Uh, Both Max and Matt were out with us in Vegas this year. And Max plays differently than Matt, even though they're both very effective players. So it's always great to get both of their opinions. So Max, thanks for taking the time to send something in. And Max says this, So I will gladly add my two cents. I am heavily an exploitative player. I try not to focus on GTO too much as essentially none of my opponents are playing optimally. In the second paragraph, that is definitely switching to exploitative play and is mainly how I play. For me, it's easier to find opponents who make errors and take advantage of those rather than to just constantly focus on not being exploited. When you've played so many thousands of hands and think critically about mistakes you've made, playing GTO comes naturally without having to put thought into it eventually, aka intuition. In all honesty, I try hard not to confuse myself with theoretical terms. I understand the concepts, but the easier you think of the game, the easier it is. Again, this is how I see it and not how the typical professional does. Hopefully, this is somewhat helpful. All right, Max. Uh, Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate uh, those words. Now we're going to switch over and hear from the pros. So let's start with uh, Jonathan Little. Jonathan says, everything sounds correct. When you know someone folds too often, you should adjust to playing an exploitative strategy to take advantage of that. You can adjust a little or drastically depending on the situation. You can also pre-adjust to take advantage of player pool tendencies. For example, if you never see river raises without the nuts, it would be silly to call anywhere near the minimum defense frequency, and perhaps you should only call with the nuts. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Now, uh, Chris Fox Wallace. Uh, if you don't know Fox, Fox is a World Series of Poker bracelet winner. Uh, he's originally from Minnesota, now lives in Vegas. Just a fantastic dude, a great friend of the Rec Poker Podcast. Um, uh, he leads Next Level Poker and just recently uh, took over the iNinja Poker brand. And uh, Fox gave us a lot of great information 
uh, here. So um, he, Chris says, uh, your first paragraph is basically correct, but again, there are always different definitions. Don't stress on it. Having a defensive definition of GTO will not make you a better player. <laughs> and then Fox says, okay, here's an old article I wrote years ago that may help. And this is a pretty long article, but I am going to read it in its entirety. Uh, it's called The Importance of Game Theory in Poker. There are a number of great players who claim to know very little or no poker theory at all. Most of these players have an intuitive understanding of the theory behind their plays, even if they haven't read books on the topic. And while you could be a great player and make lots of money without understanding any solid theory, it's a very tough to do. And almost everyone without basic knowledge about the math and logic would make more money if they learned some theory. Bottom line, it will help you make money. Game theory itself is a huge amount of knowledge and much too large a subject to try and cover in a single article. What I'll be providing is a sampling of the theory that relates to poker directly, the stuff that helps you win and understand the game better. In this article, I'm going to start to lay a foundation for your understanding of poker theory by introducing a number of very simple concepts that most players never think about. Once you understand these things, the more complex stuff doesn't seem so complicated at all. Frankly, poker theory really isn't that complicated, though the game itself certainly is. Concept number one, why we have blinds or antis. Blinds aren't just there to annoy you. They are there to stimulate action. All of the poker we regularly play starts as a fight for the blinds. Without them, the game would be very boring and tournaments would never end. Once players are forced to place some money in the pot, then we have something to fight over. The smaller those blinds are in relation to your stack, the less interest you should have in playing a hand. Remember that the basis for all poker theory starts with the blinds and the struggle between the players to add those blinds to their stack. Concept number two. Exploitative versus Nash-based or unexploitable. For many poker situations, there are two potentially correct answers. One is the one that makes the most money from your opponent's mistakes, while the other is the one that would make the most money or lose the least if everyone at your table played perfectly. I know that you won't ever play at a table where everyone at your table plays perfectly, but understanding both approaches is important. Finding the Nash equilibrium is a fine puzzle for many game theory experts, and it can help us in poker as well, even when we aren't playing by it. Finding Nash tells us what the perfect play is if we don't ever want anyone to outplay us, and gives us a starting point for finding exploitative plays. We can combine these two concepts and possibly make sense out of them if we look at a few simplified poker problems and find the solutions for them. To explain the difference between unexploitable and exploitative play, let's start with a very simple game, tic-tac-toe. If you have half a brain and have played tic-tac-toe a few times, you are probably able to figure out a perfect unexploitable strategy where you will never lose and every game will be a draw. Against most opponents, this will be the best strategy because if you depart from it, most opponents will beat you. But what if your six-year-old nephew wants to play and he makes a particular mistake? If you start off taking a corner spot, he will take the opposite corner, and when you take a side or center spot next to your corner, he will take the one next to his corner, giving you the win on your next move. You have to play in a way that gives him a chance to win by not taking the center spot, but departing from unexploitable strategy gives you the chance to win. You are playing an exploitative strategy against him to take advantage of his mistakes. Now applying it to hold him. Now let's picture a hold'em game without any blinds or antis. The correct playing style might be to only play aces if everyone else at the table is doing the same thing. But what if one of the other players is going all in every hand? Then there is a great deal of money in the pot to fight over. And while you can still win money playing only aces, you can make even more if you play aces and kings. And even more if you add queens and ace-king to the mix. The Nash solution to a game with no blinds or antis is to play only aces. Then no matter how well your opponents play, the best they can do is break even against you, and any mistake they make provides profit for you. You can never lose money in the long run playing only aces, because there are no blinds and you'll never get your chips in behind. In fact, if everyone else is only playing aces, then any other hands you choose to play are just throwing money away. The exploitative solution to the above problem is to do whatever will make you the most profit. In the case of the one opponent who is playing every hand, you could certainly play kings profitably. 
Even though someone who is still to act may wake up with aces, you'll make enough with your kings against the maniac's random hand that it will more than make up for the rare occasion where you are a 4-1 to underdog against aces. With some work, you could figure out exactly what range to play against him depending on how many players are still to act. Concept 3. The perfect exploitative play is also Nash. Sort of. In the situation above, we can probably add in more than just kings, and with some work we could even find the perfect range of hands to play. If we knew our opponents were all playing only aces except the maniac, who was playing every hand, then we could spend some time calculating and know exactly what hands to play. Then we would have found the optimal solution. Optimal means uh, that a play makes the most money and is the best choice from a mathematical standpoint. Even that solution, with a fairly simple problem, would take some time. We would have to figure it for each button position because we would need to know how many people are still to act and give each person a 1 in 220 chance of waking up with aces. Then, then, then we need to know how much equity we have against aces and a random hand and each hand we are playing. We have only two outcomes here, so our calculation would be fairly simple. Either we run into aces or we don't, so we need to know the following. How much will we win when we don't run into aces and how often will that happen? How much will we lose when we do run into aces and how often will that happen? Once we have those numbers, we can multiply each profit or loss by the frequency of its occurrence, add the numbers together, and if the result is positive, then we have a profitable play. We have then found the perfect play, assuming our opponents will always act one way. You could say we have found the optimal range for this particular situation. Concept 4. Diminishing Returns We have chosen a very simple situation above and simplified way beyond even the easiest poker games. Even that situation would require more time than you have at a typical online game, even for a theory expert. When you take away your knowledge of even one player's exact calling standards, things go completely haywire. Even if you can guess that the remaining players call with a certain percentage of their hands, the calculations get harder and more complex. When you don't know the players perfectly, it gets really tough. And when they are smart enough to start to adjust to the fact that the maniac is all in every hand and you are calling with more than aces, it gets incredibly complicated. As the calculations get more complex, they also get fuzzy and your information becomes more and more limited. By the time you have added all of the complications of a real poker game to this situation, the calculations are too much and the system breaks down. We just aren't smart enough to find the perfect play for every situation in the time that we are allotted. And if we spend every second of our allowed time calculating, we might miss tells that we would have otherwise have seen that are much more valuable, or miss some notes we have on a player from a previous session. In short, we find things that are more profitable, and we find that it's more profitable to make an educated guess and use that brain power on other aspects of the game. When we had the maniac and everyone else playing aces, it would certainly be worthwhile to figure the situation out if we were going to encounter it frequently. But the last few hands, where we earned just just tiny fractions of a percent, might not be worth calculating. That time might be better spent calling a friend and staking him in the game for half his profits, working on other parts of your game, or checking to see if there's a better table to play. So we see diminishing returns. The more complicated the process and the less likely it is to realistically apply, the less profitable it is to spend time on. Given how complicated theory can get in a real game, the basics are the most important things to know, along with hand reading, opponent profiling, note taking, table image, and watching for tells. All right, great stuff there from Chris Fox Wallace. Fox, thanks so much for uh, all you do to support the podcast and for your uh, input there. Uh, let's close off the input section of the podcast episode with thoughts from Kenna James. Uh, and Kenna was a great interview a few uh, episodes ago, and he's been great in providing input and feedback. Uh, I appreciate uh, all you've done to help help me out in my game, Kenna, and for our entire audience. Uh, Kenna says, Steve, it's a complex issue, and I understand your efforts in trying to find clarity. Here are some things for you to consider. Yes, what you are saying is basically correct. Please remember there are no absolutes, except, of course, that last statement, (laughs) Uh, which illustrates the complexity in one simple line. It's always a double-edged sword. You've spotted the challenge. It's not just a numbers game, and it's not just a people game. It is both. You and your purpose are both senior to strategy. 
As you can see by that statement, of course it is possible to do whatever you want, to play and switch strategies as often as you wish. I tend to do it in stages. I've attached a lesson I give on the stages of a tournament. I like to play exploitative in stage one and more of a GTO strategy in stage two, with a balance of both in stage three. From a broader perspective, I tend to look at tournaments as a people game and cash games as a numbers game. Therefore, GTO and cash and exploitative more in tournaments. Broad statements and conclusions, however, tend to confuse people. It's all in the details, which are always changing. Since you are a broadcaster, it may be helpful to remember that communication is for the other person. If I'm talking to a math or numbers guy, I'll talk GTO. With a creative player, I'll discuss exploitative. You've hit the nail on the head in understanding that knowing and being able to apply both at different times is the most effective overall way to play the game. It doesn't really matter what strategy you use to play a tournament. The most important thing is to make sure you realize your purpose in playing it. Okay, well, that is it. Uh, Thanks for bearing with all of just the reading there of the feedback, but I thought it was just really good stuff, and I've been processing this uh, as time has allowed (laughs) uh, over the last week or so. And obviously, as I've talked about before, uh, things may change. Uh, Even the, the initial insight that I've had from the first few Uh, may change. So uh, this is all a process of me trying to get clarity for myself and passing on what I am learning. Obviously, take it and leave it uh, as you so choose, but uh, give me feedback, man. All feedback is good feedback. I just love to wrestle with stuff and learn new things. So uh, what does all of this mean for me? I've tried to summarize based on where I'm currently at, and here are the things that I think this all means for me, at least at this point. Uh, First of all, I've always categorized myself and others as some combination of looser, tight, and passive or aggressive. So uh, some combination of those uh, things and and trying to figure out what the best strategy is for me, given my personality, my risk aversion, and whatever other factors are out there. And as I asked the question about what is the right strategy for me, I was thinking about it in terms of those combinations, thinking maybe tight, aggressive, uh, you know, maybe loose, aggressive. Um, so I asked that question and it became obvious that I was looking through the wrong lens and that I didn't really have a grounded benchmark for determining what was loose or tight or what was passive or aggressive. And as I reflect now on my current strategy, it doesn't seem to be either GTO or exploitative. Basically, I'm just tight. <laughs> uh, I am opportunistic. I'm looking for those spots to be opportunistic. Uh, But really, I'm just playing a tight uh, strategy until I can't do that any longer, until the blinds catch up. Then I have to ramp up variance and start taking chances. But I really don't have a good framework for that. Uh, Through the lens of exploitative, I realize now that I must be exploitable to the good players in a number of ways. And I know for me, this is just a hobby. uh, And I've been able to win at a rate above the rake for the smaller tournaments. But I'm now feeling like my strategy has a very limited grounding. And if I want to compete at even the next level of tournament, I feel like I need to build a better foundation. So initially what I plan to do is uh, continue to do what I'm doing, but start to intentionally understand the principles of GTO, things like minimum defense frequency. What is that? Um, And I want to continue to uh, understand the principles behind the strategy and the right times to employ it. I don't want to just jump in fully uh, and just start applying it uh, without making sure that I first have clarity of vision for this sort of strategy. And that goes back to my personality. I, I like the framework. I like to understand what the big picture is. So um, while I continue doing what I'm doing, I really want to start to understand GPO at a con- real conceptual level and make sure I'm grounded there. And then once I've done that, I really want to start building a GTO strategy and practice playing it, uh, but adjusting when there's some obvious exploitative opportunities. So This includes probably first memorizing some pre-flop ranges by position and then playing with post-flop tools to build my understanding. Uh, And once I have a decent GTO understanding and a decent strategy, I want to start incorporating exploitative adjustments based on chip stack stages of the tournament, player tendencies, uh, and this will give me an overall strategy as I approach tournaments. So I've got a long way to go uh, in my rebuilding process. And I recognize that GTO may not be the absolute best strategy in the lower level tournaments I'm playing, but I am interested enough in this. And I think it's important enough for me to take the time to learn it and have at least a working knowledge of it that I can apply. 
And ultimately, I can leverage that to move up in stakes. Part of this is my personality. I like learning new things, and it's important for me to have a framework upon which I can hang new knowledge. And I believe GTO offers me each of these things. So my immediate next steps for the podcast, I do want to go back and reevaluate the first few questions considering this insight and considering the input by players that I consider to be GTO players. And then share all of this with you guys next week as well as responses to other questions that I had asked people. And then I want to continue building my conceptual understanding of GTO, start working on building a robust pre-flop GTO strategy, and then develop some post-flop strategies. And so I'm going to be soliciting input from all of you who are on my input list uh, around those things and really start to build this out uh, further. So uh, I'm going to be leveraging the contributors, leveraging research, using some online tools and resources to build my knowledge. And if you have thoughts, I would love to hear your thoughts also. Uh, please, you can do that through the, the Facebook Rec Poker group, uh, at Rec Poker on Twitter, or email me, stevefredland at gmail.com. If you want to be a regular contributor, if you have a pretty good understanding of GTO, or you're along in this journey with us, uh, or if you're connected to somebody that could add a lot of value, please uh, let me know, and then we can add you to the list of folks that could potentially contribute uh, when your schedule allows. That would be great. So as we wrap up, another thanks to Running Aces, a great weekly tournaments, great staff, just a fun, fun folks there. We've got the Midwest Poker Classic coming up the last two weeks of September. Uh, thanks again to the Rex and pros and everybody giving feedback. Please, uh, if you want to help us grow, like, comment, rate, review, subscribe, tell others, and uh, certainly consider uh, supporting uh, what I'm doing here through Patreon dot com slash rec poker even for a dollar a month uh, that's all super appreciated there uh, if you want to wear a rec poker patch just let me know i'll get you some uh, you can go to flop the world.com slash rec poker if you want hats shirts sweatshirts and if you have any other feedback suggestions or whatever uh, do that through facebook twitter or email me so that's it uh, thanks everybody a long episode of me reading a lot of stuff but uh, hopefully it was helpful i know i'm going to be digesting it for quite some time Good luck on the felt.